let us remember that the peace we all desire for our country is in large part in your capable hands. We are committed to embracing digitization as a tool for improving work ethics within the judicial service. The world is rapidly changing, and it is important that the judiciary and the judicial service need to keep pace with these changes to, to remain effective and relevant. Digitization offers us the opportunity to streamline processes, improve efficiency, and enhance transparency in our work. For these and many more reasons, the Lady Chief Justice introduced the virtual court system, which is intended to reduce the backlog and delay of cases in court, and to again take advantage of digitization in connecting people from the comfort of their homes to participate in court proceedings. As we move forward, we must never lose sight of the core principles that, that have guided JUSAC since its inception. The defense of judicial independence and the promotion of staff integrity. These principles are the bedrock of our association and the judiciary as a whole. Judicial independence is not just a lofty ideal. It is a practical necessity for the fair and impartial administration of justice. Without it, the rule of law would be compromised and public trust in the judicial system would erode. Just as judicial independence, staff integrity is equally, is equally vital and is one of the critical areas that hand the judicial, offices, office, the judicial service. As members of one of the critical areas, as members of the justice system, we are entrusted with a sacred duty to uphold the law and administer justice without fear or favor. This requires that we maintain the highest standard of integrity in all that we do. JUSAC will continue to champion initiatives that promote ethical conduct among our members, ensuring that we remain worthy of the public trust. In a recent paper, I observed that governments that are not embracing of an open society are first realizing that they endanger democracy by not guaranteeing the one most basic right to citizens. Afrobarometer surveys over time have not only confirmed the erosion of faith in democratic structures. As citizens complain of not seeing the dividends of democracy, but these surveys have predicted accountability movements such as faced by the government of Kenya. The 2024 Afrobarometer titled African Insights 2024, Democracy at Risk, The People's Perspective, discloses how more than half of Africans, 53% across 39 countries, are willing to accept a military takeover if elected leaders abuse power for their own ends. That's how low we sink to relish military regimes where all our rights are in the hands of one person and always suppressed. It highlights receding confidence as it echoes the caution that governance cannot continue with the business as usual attitude. Undoubtedly, the recent wave in resurgence of military takeovers is partly blamable on lack of transparency and open governance. This is where I say I do not digress. In their paper, Christopher Yenevi and Richard Fosu, 2023, The African Union's Prohibition of Unconstitutional Changes of Government, an essay, an easy choice between fidelity to principle and pragmatism. The researchers at the Monash University, Australia, give a reminder about the autocratic regimes from which Africa began its democratic project. They note that a major factor that drove the period of 
Africa's political and socioeconomic stagnation was the lack of strong systems of democratic participation. Lack of strong systems of democratic participation and peaceful transfers of power. Leadership that was opaque and the lack of inclusive governance compelled resorts to destabilizing revolutionary takeovers and counter coups that saw as many as 327 coup d'etats within a space of 45 years, 1956 to 2001 in the sub-Saharan Africa alone. Although only 80 of these coups were successfully executed, a life of integrity is not in opacity. It never happens. Justice emanates from the people but it is administered on their behalf by an independent judiciary, declares Article 125 of the Constitution 1992. Integrity is the anchor of this independence as promoted by openness that is the most potent democratic tool to engender inclusive, participatory, and accountable governance to avoid a return to Africa's ugly past. So, as I mentioned, her leadership has been open, upfront in her administration, and we need that. The theme for your symposium judicial independence and integrity, critical ingredients for peaceful elections. 2024. This is a statement. It is not a question. So, I have simply been expressing my support for it. That is how easy you have made my job as your guest speaker. So, thank you very much. <clears throat> Predictability and speed are key ingredients for judicial independence. They are critically needed to engender trust for peaceful elections. If a party lives with the assurance that they will receive justice from the courts, they will be prone to avoiding extrajudicial conduct that threatens peaceful elections. Their natural default thinking would be that they would resort to the courts if wronged in the elections. I will not approve of a complaint of lack of trust in the judiciary to justify recourse and resort to unlawful, unconstitutional, or destructive and violent means to resolving concerns with the electoral process. Our fourth republic has been the most enduring and we look to its 32nd anniversary on January 7, 2025. And on this day, we will be seeing the ninth parliament constituted and a new president sworn into office. That is how proud we should be as Ghanaians. We are indeed an oasis of peace surrounded by turbulence. Political power has alternated between the NDC, that is the National Democratic Congress, and the governing New Patriotic Party, NPP. Our elections are secured not by the fists, not by the loudest chance, but by law and due process as upheld by the judiciary. That is what should make us proud. 
the NDC is presently demanding a forensic audit of the electoral roll because it has uncovered wrongs, including illegal and I dare say criminal voter transfers. These transfers were done on the blind side of the voters, contrary to law, meaning they stand potentially disenfranchised. The Supreme Court of this country has held for the sake of one man we must wait until the right things are done before elections are held. In 2015, the Electoral Commission took steps, missteps, that led to one man approaching the Supreme Court to vindicate and assert their rights. The District Assembly elections were halted by the court. It cost Ghana millions of CDs because all election materials had been printed only on the eve of the elections for it to be stopped. A court that says a prisoner has a right to vote and that right should not be taken away from them confirms that one man's vote is important. The Electoral Commission has indicted a district director for the conduct complained about a while ago. But it has declined the request for an independent audit over further claims of widespread irregularities, including illegal transfer of over 240,000 votes. At the parliamentary levels, one vote can determine the winner. One vote difference can determine the loser. The EC insists that it has fixed some of the complaints by the NDC and that it is capable of resolving similar complaints under the voter register exhibition window, which is in progress. The NDC disagrees and this is what has led to the mass nationwide demonstrations on Tuesday and with further threats of further public manifestations. The NPP threatens a counter demonstration if the EC accedes to the request for forensic audit. I interact with these two Official officers of these two parties too often. So I know when something is very laughable. But they do it. You and I must be on the lookout to avoid being deceived. To get our country where it should not get to. The issues are easily resolvable at law. But why is the NDC reluctant to approach the court? The NPP had similar concerns and demanded a fresh voters register ahead of the 2016 elections. They did not supply as much evidence, but they had a genuine complaint and I advocated for them to the chagrin of the NDC, which saw nothing wrong at the time and defended the EC the way the NPP does today. <laughs> In fact, some kept describing me as lawyer for the NPP when the NPP, like the NDC today, had not taken their particular grievance to the court. These partisans have such deep mistrust for the court when they are in government. Their premise may be faulty and the hard evidence in respect of the court's fidelity to the law may prove same for the small but important number of cases they rely on to project the court as overly biased against them in such times, only when they are in opposition. 
Elections are about the voters and not the EC. What does the EC lose in granting a request that could improve its own credibility? Badly affected by setting appointments that got civil society demanding a reversal of the decision by the president, especially in respect of Dr. Apiahene. Everything must be done to bring the needed speed and predictability to get resorts and recourse to the courts to be a natural default action by citizens generally and political parties in particular. And therein lies your role. The recent Afrobarometer survey carries concerning news for critical public institutions like the EC and the judiciary. The EC that enjoyed 75% trust in 2005 now manages only 33% public trust. There has been an erosion in the trust enjoyed by the judiciary also from a high of 65% in 2005 to 36% in 2022. It is hoped that the leading justice project will be on course to reverse the strength. The noble pursuit of the Chief Justice to turn things around will not succeed without you, the Judicial Service Staff Association. Imagine the head without the eyes, without the ears, without the mouth, without hands, without legs. The Chief Justice and her team depend on you. When I file a search, how long does it take me to get my answer? That's not the CJ's job. That's your job. When I apply for the record of proceedings, how long does it take me to get them? That's your job. If these contribute to the lack of speed, then you are to blame. So, I will not enumerate what you already know, what you ought to know, and what you ought to do, since a good measure of what erodes trust in the courts come from your interaction, your interface with the public. We have heard about dedicated rules for election-related disputes. And we have celebrated that within civil society. At the bar conference, a leadership, the Chief Justice, made this announcement. In a recent CDD survey, an overwhelming 98.4% of Ghanaians who have ever participated in parliamentary election litigation as parties, lawyers, judges and observers say they want the rules of court amended to speed up the time it takes for the resolution of parliamentary election disputes. Over 40% of 53 of the respondents of the CDD survey want such disputes to be resolved within 30 days. And a whopping 63.3% of the 61 carefully selected respondents, remember, judges inclusive, desire that if such cases proceed to final appeal, the Court of Appeal should dispense with such appeals also within 30 days. The average period for determining such disputes in Ghana is more than one year. 
while the courts in Kenya and England are likely to dispense with such cases in six months and seven months, averagely, respectively. In fact, these courts, as well as those in Ghana, have on occasions resolved such cases within 30 days. I have been a witness to such. In 2016, I represented someone from the Kwesimintim constituency. The CJ ordered expeditious trial. It took us two weeks, two weeks, with Justice Banasco Esa presiding to complete the case. Just recently in Tamale, I completed another such dispute. It took us about the same time for the trial. So it is possible to get speed to engender trust in the system. The rules of court in Kenya, for instance, make time limits to secure expeditious resolution of such disputes a matter of law rather than discretion of a judge. In Ghana, the rules have recently been amended to try presidential election petitions within 42 days. We saw the results as compared to 2012-2013 when it took eight long months and brought the economy to a standstill. And guess what? In that circumstance, the rule was that the trial was to be expeditious. Expedition took us eight months. It is because of discretion. By the Kenyan constitution, a presidential election petition must terminate in a period of 14 days after it has been filed in the Supreme Court. This is what is happening elsewhere. It is possible here in Ghana. The Chief Justice needs you to be able to secure predictability and speed to engender trust so we will all resort to the court as a last resort of dispute resolution and avoid trouble in this country. Play your role and we shall all secure a credible, peaceful elections 2024. Independence and impartiality of the judiciary. An independent and impartial judiciary is indeed an essential ingredient in fair, free, and fair elections. As aptly stated by Julius Nyerere, a former president of Tanzania, unless judges perform their work promptly, sorry, properly, none of the objectives of a democratic society can be met. Judicial independent, independence, as defined by Abrahamson, embodies the concept that a judge decide, decides cases fairly, impartially, and according to the facts and law, not according to whom, prejudice, or fear, the dictates of the legislature, or executive, or the latest opinion pool. Judicial independence simply denotes an independent judiciary, not subject to improper influence, from the other branches of government or from private or partisan interest. That one could be more dangerous, right? The idea of establishing a separate and neutral judiciary is very important. The main reason is to serve as a safeguard against wanton use of power. Since in the words of Lord Acton, power tends to corrupt, quote, power tends to corrupt and absolute power corrupts absolutely." Unquote. Sophia Akufu JSC, as she then was, in Attorney General No. 2 versus Chachuchikata No. 2, citation provided, also described independent 
judicial independence as, quote, a core principle of our collective concept of constitutional democracy as enshrined in the Constitution, unquote. This democratic concept can only be sustained through security of tenure for judges, financial independence, and the insulation of judges from civil action. These attributes collectively form the nucleus around which the concept of judicial independence revolves. Judicial independence is also rooted in respect for the rule of law as guardians of the constitution and the rights of individuals. Judges must uphold the law at all times. In view of this, it is important to ensure that judges are not subject to pressure and influence and are free to make impartial decisions based solely on the facts and the law. An independent judge can assure that election-related cases are decided according to the law and the facts and not based on a shifting political climate. The above constitutes the relevance of judicial independence and a guarantee to citizens' right to free and fair elections. Competence of judges and fidelity to the law. To have a vibrant judiciary which can effectively adjudicate matters relating to the 2024 elections, it is important for judges to display competence and fidelity to the law. Judges must endeavor to have a sound understanding of the law relating to the issues in contention and must deliver themselves without fear or favor. Highlighting the importance of competent and ethical judges, Charles Evans Hughes, in the 1925 presidential address, he was the president of the American Bar then. In his 1925 presidential address to the American Bar Association stated, and I quote, a poor judge is perhaps the most wasteful indulgence of the community. You can refuse to patronize a merchant who does not carry good stock, but you have no rec recourse if you are hauled before a judge whose mental or moral goods are inferior. <laughs> he continued, an honest, high-minded, able, and fearless judge is the most valuable servant of democracy. <laughs> For he illuminates justice as he reinterprets and applies the law, as he makes clear the benefits and the shortcomings of the standards of individuals and community rights among a free people, unquote. Coupled with technical competence, judges must develop the courage, I mean we judges, must develop the courage to adjudicate such politically charged cases in electoral disputes. When the judicial system lacks the clout, capacity, or credibility to effectively resolve election-related disputes, it can lead to violence and create a culture of impunity. Misgivings about the outcome of judicial adjudication, I mean, we the judges, yeah. Misgivings about the outcome of judicial adjudication of electoral disputes should not deter judges. Judges must be true to their oath and hand down the decision the dispute demands. In Joshua M. Kofi versus Dokas Tofe, an electoral commission, suit number E12 stroke 11 stroke 21, delivered on 21st November 2022, the Secondary High Court, presided over by my good self, 
delivered itself in the opening statement of the judgment of the parliamentary election petition as follows. And my lady permits me to quote the opening statement of that judgment. Election and its related matters present a phenomenal sense of passion amongst considerable number of people in a democratic state. This explains the highest, the, sorry, this explains the heightened interest in election petitions. However, misgivings about the outcome of judicial adjudication of electoral disputes is a regular feature, feature in some jurisdictions. Ghana has had its fair share of such controversies in the aftermath of electoral litigations and other disputes. It is fair to state that as judges, we are undaunted by controversies in general because we are used to resolving them. Ultimately, it is fidelity to the law and fidelity alone that would vindicate the court. In this respect, I am inspired by the words of Osegre JSC of blessed memory in the Supreme Court case of Jehu versus Asari, the second, 1991 1WASC 169, where the eminent jurist once delivered himself thus at page 186 of the report, and I quote, a court of justice called upon to resolve a dispute, I repeat, must neither play the role of the artful dodger of Dickensian creation, nor indulge in diplomatic double talk, intending to hurt no one, but must seize the bull by the horns and hand down the decision the dispute demands, unquote. I think this, uh, this is perhaps the, the most self-serving quotation from a speaker. Yes, because the speaker, the speaker quoted his own words, and as part of the words are uh, the words of the speaker's late father. So it must be very self-serving. <laughs> Justice delivery is respectfully not a noise-making contest, where the loudest emerges victorious. It is about application of the law to the facts in contention. Therefore, a judge's greatest disservice to the society is to succumb to the out-of-court statements of parties and their supporters and hand down decisions based solely on populist appeal. Cases are won in the courtroom and not in the court of public opinion. Thus, no matter how unpopular the outcome of an electoral dispute may appear, it is the quality of the decision that will stand the test of time. Again, the complementary role of the judicial service staff comes to the fore. Process servers must ensure that parties are served timelessly. It's very important time your service. They must endeavor to file proof of service or affidavit of non-service on the case docket before any court sitting. The registry must ensure that court notes and orders of the court are ready after every court sitting. You ensure that if there is any order, the order is drawn, signed by the judge, the court notes are ready to be served on the parties. Effective execution of these and many other duties, some of them were enumerated by Leonard Senior Counsel. Many other duties of the judicial service staff will also ensure fair trial and speedy delivery of justice. Now the question of speedy trial of electoral disputes. Again, Leonard Senior Counsel spoke extensively about that, but let me add some few words to it. It is in the interest of justice for electoral disputes to be adjudicated promptly by the courts. The right to fair hearing also requires legal proceedings to be con conducted expeditiously. The maximum justice delayed 
is justice denied requires election petitions to be heard and determined promptly. However, despite this principle, it is observed that election petitions in Ghana rarely enjoy speedy trial. I mean, the, especially the parliamentary election petition. Now we are fine with the presidential election petition because of the new, 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 new regime in terms of the rules of procedure. Delays in the adjudication process relating to electoral disputes is a fatal on democracy. It undermines the legitimacy of an elected official and it creates room for speculation by section, we are in a rumor mongering society. I mean, we know that. So it creates room for speculation by sections of the public that the judicial process may be rigged in favor of one party as against the other. Continuous delay dims a party's hope of enjoying the fruit of his litigation if he emerges victorious. While the matter drags, an illegitimate legislator may be enjoying the fruits and privileges of an office to which he has no valid claim. All these expose the judiciary to negative publicity. Based on my own experience, following the, the adjudication of parliamentary election petitions, I had a, is it a, a privilege or a misfortune? Maybe it's a privilege or whatever it is of adjudicating two of those cases uh, for the 2020, 2020 parliamentary elections, two of them. So based on my own experience and based on observations of the outcome of other electoral disputes as well as literature on the adjudication of electoral disputes, some of the key reasons for the delay in the resolution of electoral disputes can be summarized as follows. One, lack of seriousness on the part of litigants is a factor responsible for the delay in election cases. After filing their cases, some petitioners will not diligently prosecute their cases. On the other hand, a respondent may do everything humanly possible to frustrate the hearing and determination of the petition. Two, some lawyers engage in electoral litigations. Some lawyers engage in electoral litigations, do not prioritize the hearing of those cases. Considerable number of lawyers conduct the cases pro bono due to, it may be due to some, some of the cases, it may be due to party affiliation, not all cases anyway. This coupled with the volume of work they have to attend to in respect of other engagements, compel them to make choices which tend to sacrifice the demands associated with the management of the electoral dispute. This is manifested in their request for long adjournments. Three, dilatory tactics are also employed by some lawyers to prolong the trial to allow the incumbent to remain in power while the trial is ongoing. Of course, he has been elected, so he's still enjoying his position, even though the trial progresses. And if you don't take care, by the time you get to the determination of the matter, his term has almost ended, or it's even over. Right, so that is a factor. Four, provisions of the rules of courts are exploited by some lawyers To stall proceedings, the rules of procedure have opened a floodgate for respondents to file all sorts of frivolous applications to challenge the petition presented by the petitioner. Closely related to, these, to this is a right to appeal against an interlocutory decision of the courts. The appeal process is sometimes used as a tool to stultify proceedings. Proposals for speedy trial. 
election petitions are said to be sui generis. In other words, they are special proceedings, proceedings of its own kind or class, unique or peculiar. It, is therefore, it therefore requires special rules of procedure aimed at speedy and effective justice. It is therefore prudent for the rules of court committee to come out with special rules to ensure expeditious disposal of election disputes. That's uh, rules akin to the rules relating to presidential, uh, uh, presidential election petition. And I'm reliably informed that very soon uh, there will be special rules in relation to that. And I've, I was delighted to, to, to uh, I also presented, I had the privilege of presenting proposals to the committee on how to, in respect of the timelines, how to, how to ensure speedy trials. But even in the absence of these specific rules relating to timelines, we, the judges, <laughs> must also endeavor to, as much as possible, conduct the matter on a daily basis within the period specified for trial. Demands for long adjournment should not be entertained. Interlocutory applications must also be decided promptly. Promptly. Maybe you can write a ruling in a couple of days if it demands a reasoned ruling. But you endeavor to do an on, on, on a bench ruling to ensure speedy, speedy trial. These and many other mechanisms can be deployed by judges to ensure speedy and effective adjudication of electoral disputes. In conclusion, I will say that a peaceful election is a shared responsibility. It involves all stakeholders in the democratic process, the electoral commission, political parties, civil society organization, the chiefs, and the entire populace. Of all the stakeholders, the judiciary stand tall when it comes to the resolution of electoral disputes. It is concluded, let's say something again. It is concluded that the judiciary can only contribute towards a peaceful election through their adjudication role if it upholds its independence and integrity. It is only an impartial judiciary, as I've already said, stated, that can hear and peacefully resolve electoral disputes and in so doing ensure integrity and accountability of the electoral process and help uphold the rule of law. So as persons responsible for justice delivery, it is critical that we understand the structure of the justice infrastructure of our nation. We cannot afford to be people who are not diligent, who are not co competent, and who are not interested in learning. We cannot afford to be people who, are, who join in, in a money-making mentality. So this morning I have come here, or this afternoon, I have come here to ask you, as staff of judicial service, to be sensitive in your work, to be learners, because justice is always according to law. And the law of Ghana is complex, is sophisticated, is structured, and is often diverse. As Chief Justice, I am particularly disturbed by the way in which land litigation seems to have taken over our courts. And the general impression that all is fair in money making, such that even the sacred process of justice delivery is subjected to exploitation of the citizen. We should have a conscience. 
we must apply our conscience to working with diligence, integrity, and moral aptitude. This is why the basic qualification for being a judge, apart from a qualification in law, is moral character and proven integrity. And the same is required of all staff who work with the judiciary. When a court staff who is totally unaware about how the law of contract works, pretends and begins to prepare affidavits and court processes, and this is where the preachers will say, am I speaking to somebody? When you pretend and begin to prepare court processes, for a court user who has already suffered from a damaged business transaction, we are adding to the messiness of disputes in the courts. And we are creating records that make justice delivery almost impossible. In the same way, a court staff who is totally unaware about how land law works and who pretends that they do and so prepares an indenture for people entering into land transaction. Am I talking to somebody? That court staff is creating a nightmare of injustice. And indeed, it has been discovered that many indentures cannot be registered. And these have led they reflect in the intractable disputes that we have in the courts. There are so many unjust outcomes because of these habits of court staff. Ladies and gentlemen, even worse is the situation. I wish the press wasn't here and I wish I was talking to you alone, but you brought the cameras and the microphones. Even worse is a situation where court staff join criminal gangs to prepare fake divorce and other orders that have forged signatures on them. Recently, I heard some song, if you know, you know. Agbagola. <laughs> you know, you know. The Nigerian man is here. You know what I'm talking about. So long as there are burgers out there who need these certificates, they come into the court premises. And some of you have become traders in this thing. Let me assure you. I recently saw some videos shown by the CID after their investigations in the court premises. And it's extremely disturbing. I want, how is it possible? And let me also talk about the fake letters of administration orders that are used to wipe out the accounts of dead people, leaving their rightful heirs empty handed and in pain. Please, let us stop these practices. Let us stop these practices. Don't think that you need money so much that you must make yourself an agent of injustice. You don't think it's injustice. You think you are just um, utilizing your position. But in the end, you are causing mayhem. It's a, there's a story I would like to share with you and it's about a friend of mine who married a foreigner. We heard Mr. Yenini talk about searches. This, my friend, her husband died. And in his homeland, he had property that had been inherited from his family. His brother also died. And so my friend's children were supposed to inherit these properties. When, whilst they were in Ghana, 
their marriage went through a divorce. These children needed the records of the divorce. As the guns will say, Kabashing Mene. So if you have encountered me during this time, I have been extremely aggressive about the way we keep records. When you go back to your court docket session managers, registrars, I beg of you, take better care of people's records. The courts are the registries of the rights and entitlements of the nation. We keep the records of people's rights. Think of your brother or sister or your cousin whose father may have died and whose records, employment records have gone through the court processes or who has applied to have access and that person cannot get access to the entitlements of their parents because we messed around with their records. It is all of these reasons that makes your theme for today resonate with me. And this is why I asked Dr. Osesha to speak to the academic side so that I can speak to the domestic side. I have come here at the end of my first year in office as Chief Justice to congratulate you. I have also come here as someone who came out of law school 38 years ago and has spent that entire period within court premises. I say that I left law school and crossed the gate and came into court and I haven't left. I have been a litigation lawyer. I have been a judge working under four chief justices. Chief Justice Akwa, Chief Justice Wood, Chief Justice Ekufu, Chief Justice Enin Yeboa, and now as Chief Justice myself, I need you to know that I know the courts. I know what you do. I know how you do it. I have seen you do it. And so I am here to beg you to join me in changing the image of the Judicial Service of Ghana as a corrupt institution. The Judicial Service of Ghana is to do its work with consideration of the directive principles of state policy under Chapter 6 of the 1992 Constitution. Sorry. This means that we must work with the welfare of the vulnerable in mind. How can we attract Ghanaians to live in their own country when you cannot buy land much more built? How do we attract foreigners to invest in land, property, employment in con and contracts, and increase wealth in the country? We can only do this when it is easy for the most vulnerable to assess the courts. We can only do this if we work with diligence, integrity, and conscientiousness in the guiding values that the Constitution entreats us to work with. Indeed, we hear of countries that attract high foreign investment and where citizens are paid highly. Some of these countries have similar histories to Ghana. What is the difference between us and them? It's not because their electoral processes are, just, are so excellent. The difference is discipline, integrity, and competence in the public service especially in their justice and other regulatory systems. This is a simple secret, and this is the key to prosperous economies. I can assure you, if we as judicial service decide 
I know that there's, not, there's some strange virus in the air where everything is politicized. But we are an independent arm of government. And I have come to ask you, let us decide to be excellent. Let us decide to do our work with competence, conscientiousness, integrity, and independence. And you will see You will see investors in our country. And you will see the reflection in your own pay. I know that virus wants to rope judges into their political conversations. Poor me, I'm sitting my somewhere. Everything I do is supposed to be in a political direction. I guess it goes with the territory. The important thing is when a case comes, I will deal with it according to to law. The courts are supposed to work according to law and nothing else. And if some people think that because the law, I don't know, they don't understand the law, they don't understand anything, well, I don't know if they think they need to say things about judges. We are used to doing sitting every day, every day, you know, as a judge, every day you annoy at least 20 people. If your case, your, your case list has 20 cases in a day, you are likely to annoy 20 people because even when you give an adjournment, that can be annoying. That's why I always say I don't understand judges who take bribes because we annoy people without even doing anything. So ladies and gentlemen, if we in the, in the courts resolve to do the right thing, wealth creation will increase in our country for our own sake, for the sake of our brothers and sisters, for the sake of our children, I implore you to appreciate this key to prosperity, which is excellent public services that deliver with independence and integrity. Technology is extremely expensive, and I need the cooperation of all staff to use the technology that has been made available to you to serve the nation. The law is a place for the learned, and those who work in it must be willing learners.